Hey everyone, welcome back to part three of my roguelike tutorial series for complete beginners in Godot. Today we're going to be looking at adding an enemy character into our game and getting him to chase the player using Godot's built-in navigation nodes. To start off, let's create an enemy scene and an enemy folder. We're going to go ahead and make it a character body 2D because we're going to be influencing its movement with code as well as it's going to be interacting with the physics engine. We're just going to go ahead and call this swords. This is going to be a pretty rudimentary enemy. I might go into making a little bit more complicated enemies with more in-depth pathfinding, but we're going to keep it pretty straightforward for now as it's already complicated enough. In here, we're just going to add a sprite and a collision shape as well as a navigation agent. When you type in nav, you'll see we have four different 2D nodes for navigating. There's a navigation agent, which is going to be the node that we attach to any agent in our game that is going to be pathfinding somewhere. A navigation obstacle, which can be used to prevent your navigation agents from trying to path into it. And a navigation region, which sort of tells your agent the general area in which it's looking for a path. So again, we're going to be adding a navigation agent to our swordsman enemy because it is an agent that is going to be navigating in our navigation region. Now we're going to go ahead and set its sprite. For this, I'm just going to go into our assets under units, and I'm going to pick out the red warrior. I'm just going to use his idle animation for now. We're going to animate all of our characters at some point in the future, but that's for the next video. This idle animation has eight horizontal frames, so go ahead and set that. And we're going to give it a circle collision shape, kind of like we did for the player. That'll be just a little bit smaller than the character itself. Under the character body 2D, there is a property called motion mode. It can either be set to grounded or floating. Basically, this changes the way that the physics engine interacts with the character. Grounded is for 2D games like Mario. And floating is for 2D games where, like ours, we're sort of looking top down at our characters. Let's go ahead and set its collision layer to be on the enemy layer and have him look to the player, enemy, and environment layers. Now we need to create a simple script that will allow him to chase the player. We're going to go ahead and click the create script button and we're just going to leave it as swordsman in the enemy folder. In order for our enemy to be able to chase our player, our enemy has to know where the player is. There's a lot of built-in ways to get References from one object to another that don't have any other attachments to them. A lot of times this will be done through some global script and you will pass information from like the player down here up to your global script and then like back down to your enemy. This is a little bit convoluted theming, but it's usually a much cleaner way to write your code. We're going to go for a little bit of a simpler and dirtier approach. Go ahead and create the ready function in your script. Remember that the ready function is called each time that this scene gets loaded into the game. So immediately when the swordsman spawns in, he's going to run this line of code. In a game like ours, we always know that there's going to be a player in our scene. So instead of going for one of the fancier ways of getting access to other nodes, we can use a function called get first node in group. And basically what that does is from a parent node, you are able to search all of its children and find the first one that is labeled into a specific group. So we're going to start all the way from the top with the get tree function. When your game is actually running, like if you click over here in your level scene, you'll see that level one is at the very top of your scene tree. When the game is running, there is a little level above this, and this is your root uh, of your tree. So when you use the get tree function, you're starting at the very top of your scene tree. And we're going to do get tree dot get first node in group as a string. You're going to type in player. And then over in your player scene, what I want you to do is over in the inspector area. Well, now that I'm realizing it, we should change this character body 2D to floating mode as well. But we should go to node and you need to go to groups. I had already made this player group as I was testing this out. But what you can do is you can uh, click this plus right here and make the name of your group set it to global and then just go ahead and hit okay now that that group is set to global your other scripts are going to be able to find it that are outside of that scene so now we're going to have a reference to our player node let's go ahead and save that in a variable called player ref and i want to set this to a type called player 
Now, Godot has no built-in player type, but you can make your own types, also called classes, and by making specific references to those classes, the editor will recognize your variable as that class, and it will be able to autofill in different functions and properties attached to that class, where otherwise you might have to try and guess and remember and click back and forth between your scripts, wondering like, oh, what did I call that variable again? This will make it a little bit easier. So since this is probably throwing an error for you, the easy way to do this is go to your player script and just at the very top of it, type in class name space player. I think there's a very good argument for you to do this with every single script that you write for every single node that you make. If you have a game with a ton of different nodes, you can start clogging up what they call the namespace and it can add like a little bit of overhead to your game. But I think especially with a small project like this, the benefit that it gives you is super worth the millisecond that it takes to type in class name. So now that we know that our player reference is going to be of type player, we also can't set player ref to anything else. And that will prevent us from making errors down the road where like maybe we tried to put in a different node as our player. That might not be the best example because you're always going to be trying to put a player into player ref, but it's very easy to get variables like mixed up and turned around. We also need to have our enemy moving at a constant speed. I'm going to arbitrarily set this to 100. This is a number that we can tweak later on, but I'm just more concerned about us getting it working first. I'm then going to also add a physics process function where I'm going to use our move and slide function. So now we need to start interacting with our navigation agent so that way we can set where we want to go and be able to get the path. Fortunately, the navigation agent already has a star pathfinding built into it. So you just need to tell it where to go and it's going to figure out the way to get there. In your script, in order to access any variable from your scene tree that is underneath of your main tree that you've got your script in, Godot has a very handy tool where we can type in at on ready and then var. I'm just going to call it nav agent. And then we're going to be able to grab our navigation agent from here and you can drag it in and it will hold it. You can also start by typing the dollar sign and typing in navigation agent. And basically what this will do is when the script enters the scene on ready, it's almost the same as putting it down here in the ready function, except this can be a little bit of a cleaner way to keep all of your global variables in the global scope rather than having nav agent down here in our ready function and then not being able to access it anywhere else in our script. If that's not a familiar concept to you, global variables up here in the top are going to be accessible all throughout your script. Whereas variables that are defined like under functions or inside of for loops or if statements will not be accessible outside of those small snippets of code. So now that we have access to our navigation agent, we can open its documentation to get an idea of what we want to do with it. You can do so by right clicking on the node and then clicking open documentation. You can see down here in our properties list that we have a target position property, which is a vector two. If we click on this, we can see that this is the position that we are setting that we want our navigation agent to be able to get to, which in our case is we want him walking straight at the player. In our script, we want to actually do this in our physics process. We're going to say nav agent dot target position is going to equal our player ref. Remember, this is talking directly about our player node. And so we just want our player's position. The reason that we're going to be updating this every physics tick is because our player is going to be moving around. And so we want the target destination of our navigation agent to always be where the player is standing. Constantly updating this can be a little bit costly performance wise. And so if we run into any performance issues, we might consider running this on a timer instead of every physics tick. But for now, this is going to be good enough. So now that we know where we're going, we want our navigation agent to automatically design a path for us to follow. So let's go back over to our documentation. And you'll notice on the left side, we can click right here and we can jump over to our methods. There's a couple functions in this list that kind of sound right, but the one that we're looking for is get next path position. Basically what this does is it returns the position in our automatically generated path that our player wants to start moving towards next. So since this is just returning a vector 2D, which is our global coordinate that we're going to be traveling to, we're going to need to do some things in our player's physics process in order to get it to move towards the given location. What I'm going to do is take the velocity property 
of our character body 2D, and I'm going to set it equal to our position dot direction two, and then our next path position, which we're going to be able to do by typing nav agent dot get next path position. And then we need to multiply this value by our speed. The direction two function is built into all vector twos. And what it does is it returns the normalized vector. So remember, we had to normalize our player's movement vector in order to make diagonal movement not faster than up and down side to side movement. And this is basically just using this formula right here. So we're getting the direction from our player to our next path position. And then we need to multiply that direction by speed in order to actually move that direction. So now let's go ahead and put our swordsman into our level by going over to our level scene and placing our swordsman scene as a child of level one. And you'll see in 2D, we've got him here. Let's go ahead and set him in our level. And if we wanna make sure that his pathing is working right, we can go into the navigation agent properties in the inspector and let's set debug to enabled. And then we can go ahead and run our scene. And you'll notice that he's not pathing anywhere. And that's because we don't have a navigation region in which he will get the data necessary to draw his navigation path. So let's go ahead and add one to our level. An interesting thing about the navigation region is that it actually needs to be the parent of your tile maps. So go ahead and move it up in the scene tree and go ahead and make your tile map layers children of the navigation region. And you'll notice here that it's throwing an error because it doesn't have a navigation polygon. So we're just gonna go ahead and add that resource in by clicking on the empty and then clicking new navigation polygon. You'll notice up here at the top, we have this new fancy button called bake navigation polygon. This won't do anything yet because we need to add some navigation layers to our tile maps. To do so, we are no longer able to edit our tile map directly from this scene because remember we saved it as its own scene called the level map. So go ahead and open up your level map and go into your tile set in here. And in the tile set properties in your inspector, let's go ahead and add a navigation layer. I'm not going to worry about naming a bunch of navigation layers because we're only going to be using the one. But if you had a bunch of different types of enemies that needed to path in different ways, like if you had some enemies that could only travel in water, you might set some different navigation layers so that your water units could navigate the water and your land units would navigate the land and not vice versa. We're going to go ahead and paint this on sort of the same way that we did collision by going into our tile set. We're going to go to paint. Fair warning to you all to be continuously saving as you're working on your projects as when I clicked tile set here, my editor crashed. I hope I brought everything back up to where we were as we were going through, but you might see me redo something just because I don't remember exactly everything that was or wasn't already done. So in our paint, we're going to go ahead and paint a navigation layer. Oops, that looks like one of the things that got undone. Make sure you actually have your navigation layer and then you'll be able to paint it. Now you'll notice this is pretty much the same looking type thing as our collision, except we have the opposite goal. Instead of us wanting to mark out everywhere that the player can't be, we want to mark out everywhere that they can be. So for each of these, you're gonna be moving these polygons again, and you're just gonna be making sure that everywhere that we want them to be walking is lit up. Okay, once you've got the navigation added, it should look something a little bit like this. Now, since we've already got our tiles placed from when we built out our map, it's going to automatically update with this information. And when we go back to our level one, we can hit bake navigation polygon, and you can see that it has baked this really weird shape. And this will basically tell our enemy where it is and is not allowed to go. You'll see that it already kind of worked in these rocks because they have collision shapes on them. But we're going to run into some problems with these really small areas here. Let's go ahead and run our game to see what it kind of looks like. Now you'll see that our player is navigating and he's getting himself caught on these rocks. And this is great. If you were running with a game that didn't have a lot for the enemy to get caught on, you can see that he's following me pretty good. This would work for a game like Vampire Survivors, but we need something a little bit more specific for our game. For starters, our enemy was getting caught on the walls. If you go to our swordsman scene, you can see there's a property here called wall min slide angle. Basically, our player is going to be smart enough that when he's walking into a wall, he's not going to be walking straight into it, so he's going to move past it just fine. But our computer is dumb, and so we kind of have to help him out. If we set this min slide angle to zero, he's now going to slide along the navigation layer and the collisions as smooth as the player would. You'll remember earlier that I mentioned 
that we need navigation obstacles. And that's something that we're going to add to our rock, which is a navigation obstacle. Go ahead and add in the navigation obstacle 2D node to our static body 2D. I should have mentioned this earlier, but it just occurred to me. You'll see down here, it says that all of these navigation nodes are experimental, meaning that they're, sus they're susceptible to be changed or removed in future versions. So this is one of those situations where if you're working on a project that uses this navigation, you might not want your Godot engine to be automatically updating because these things are very likely to change from version to version. Now for our navigation obstacle, all we need to do is increase this radius until we feel like it pretty well surrounds our rock. I'm gonna just gonna go ahead and set it to around 34. There's one more property that we wanna change here. This is the effect navigation mesh. Basically what this does is it will prevent your navigation mesh from baking polygons in the avoidance area, which is gonna prevent our navigation agents from pathing into it. So go ahead and toggle this on and make sure that you hit control S to save this scene. If you made this change and didn't save the scene, when you come over here to your main level and clear and rebake, it would not take into account the changes that you made over here in the rock scene. So whenever you're working on main scenes like this that are being reused in other levels, make sure that you save them in order for those changes to take effect. So now that our navigation polygon has been rebaked, let's go ahead and see how our enemy paths. Okay, so he's still getting a little bit confused, but in general, he's handling it much better. Oh, but we still got him stuck. Something really interesting that we can do is we can go into our debug and turn on visible navigation. Now when we load our scene, we can see not only where our collision, where our navigation polygon has been drawn, but we can see all of our tiles where we drew navigation on them. So basically what's happening here is there's two navigation polygons being drawn on top of each other, one from our bake and one from our tile set. What I found is that it was not possible to bake this navigation mesh without having the navigation layers set up on my tile set, but that at the same time, the navigation layers in my tile set was really screwing with the way that this auto generation was working. The solution that I found was that going into my tile map layer, I can turn off this property here called navigation enabled. What this will do is it'll turn off the navigation that we drew when it's considering the game, but it will still draw and bake our navigation polygon correctly. I don't know if there's a better way around that. I had to really wrestle with it for like two hours in order to get it straight. And now when we run it, we see that he's pathing perfectly. He's not getting caught on a single corner. He's not getting caught on these rocks. He's always going around them. Again, there might be a smoother way to get this result, but this was the most consistent way that I could find and is going to work procedurally on every single one of the levels that you design. You are able to manually draw your own collision polygons, but as you can see from the monstrosity that it auto-generated, this would suck to have to draw on your own. But here at Solo Dev Any% Percent, we believe in one thing and that is results. It doesn't matter how you get there, just that you did. Your players are not gonna like your game more or less based on whether or not you used a cooler method to get the result. The result is what counts. And he's pathing like a champ. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and call it there. Enemy navigation is really complicated. I think mostly because there's not a lot of strong documentation for it. I hope that now after seeing what I've made with it, that you feel like it's a little bit more comprehensible and maybe you can do some of your own cool things with it. I really appreciate you guys tagging along with me as I've been making this series. If you want to keep following along with this series, make sure to hit that subscribe button and let me know down in the comments if you have any questions over what I went over. I've been doing my best to reply to everybody because my objective with this is that everyone is able to understand so that they can make their own games. Thanks again for watching you guys. Take it easy.